that's very kind of you. Can you hear me? Yes, that's very kind of you. It's untrue, but welcome. I, I think um, uh, that to uh, address anybody you don't know, a group of people you don't know, is always impertinent. Um, but we have to do it, I suppose. But I feel it's even more impertinent today because you all know more about these subjects than I do. And that's just a fact. Um, uh, you're specialists in these areas uh, to a degree that I am not. So I thought uh, when I was asked that it was important that I would come and talk, but with that proviso. So you have to be indulgent. Um, what I thought I would do is perhaps talk about drama in general, because it's curious, uh, very often one can be involved, or I can anyway, be involved in an activity and one forgets really what the purpose of it all is. You know, it sort of gets uh, taken up in the details and the administration and things of that sort. I never begin a play, I never write a play, or I never direct a play without saying to myself, I do not know how to write a play and I don't know how to direct one. And that's absolutely true. And I dare say the people I'm working with would agree heartily. <laughs> but it's also true in a deeper sense uh, that uh, society changes so quickly, the world changes so quickly now that one must always be conscious, yes, of one's skills, but also of the great gift of one's ignorance. Uh, I think that what I will do is uh, try very briefly to describe what I see the situation in drama in general now, because there are, there are obvious uh, practical difficulties between drama for young people and drama for adults. But uh, apart from that, they're very much the same. They're very much in the same sort of problem the administrative problems, the institutional problems, the financial problems that you have at the moment are exactly the problems that exist in the, uh, the adult theatre. I ought to say adults in quotes, I think. Uh, it's just that they deal with their problems, I think, less honourably and with uh, less of a sense of purpose. Perhaps because they can be remoter from their audience. I don't know. What I would try and do is, is describe what I see the situation at the moment very, very briefly. Then I'm going to try and, and produce a, a potted history of drama, which will be sensational if I can get through it. Uh, but s simply to remind us that we are involved, if you disappear tomorrow, it's not that you've disappeared after 2, 5, 10, 15, 20 years' work. You disappear after 10,000 years' work. And I think it's important to remember that. Uh, uh, and I think that's not a, re a rhetorical statement. I think that society is in one of its periods of radical change where one has no guarantee of what will happen. So in that sense, it's a serious matter. When I've, uh, when I've gone through that potted history, I would try and put the two things together and talk more specifically about what the, uh, the, the problems of drama as opposed to the drop problems of, of society are, though you can't, you can't really divide the two. So what I will, uh, what I will do is uh, just follow that pattern of, of, of three stages. Many of the things I say will appear to be paradoxical, if not deliberately paradoxical. Well, a lot of them could be uh, normalized and explained away, but uh, then I think they would disappear. And I think that the truth at the moment very often does lie in these paradoxes. Well, what is drama? Or what is art? I mean, I'm going to talk about drama, uh, but what I say applies to, to art in general. It applies specifically to drama because drama is the spoken art. And uh, um, it, it gets very closely related to other and, and immediately related to other speaking practices in society, conversation, shopping, administration, law, and all those sorts of things. They all closely uh, relate to the drama of any society. Well, I have a, I, I, I divide uh, the, the, the problem basically into three stations. Uh, 
that's just a model for, for, for my convenience. The stations aren't quite as discreet as I would uh, propose that they are, but it's a useful model. So what you have over here on the left, you have the subject, the people, the community. Here in the center, you have the administration, the state, the church. It can take various forms historically. And over there, you have something else which I will call the boundary. Uh, now, the boundary uh, is in many ways the most important of those three stages, at least in the contrivances of culture. Oddly enough, the boundary does not exist. Well, what's that arrangement about? That arrangement is to meet people's needs. We live in a community. Uh, in order to meet our needs, our needs are simple, they're, um, they're to or they should be simple, they're to uh, have food, they're to have shelter, they're to have clothing, they're to have security. Uh, they're to have memory, things of those, the, uh, things of those, the, the, of those sort. Very, very basic things. And uh, communities come together and they organize themselves because they say collectively we can meet those needs better than individually. And the organization is done by station two, obviously. Now, sometimes the organization can be very remote from the subjective people, uh, the subject people, or it can be the two can always, uh, almost, almost merge. But what the trick is, what uh, happens is that the center group, the authority group, says it can talk for the boundary. It will interpret the boundary to the subject. It's a very, very curious thing about uh, human beings that, and you can, uh, you can uh, take this apart in the anatomy of the mind. Uh, you can, uh, you, you have to say, that human beings ask questions. And they ask questions which are in some ways uh, superfluous. Um, the mind has a capacity greatly beyond uh, the need it has to meet its needs. I mean, you know, why do we ask questions about the stars? You know, if, we don't act, if we're not in a position, for instance, where we have ships, why? No, it's an absurd question. Dogs aren't worried about the, the stars. Human beings are worried about the stars. In other words, we have to have some explanation of the total world we see around us, of the total universe. And of course, we don't know. Uh, but that total area, which relates to the boundary, is also a place of fear and anxiety. In order to meet needs, in order to control uh, a community, um, a community produces dissension, fear, uh, it produces authorized forms of joy, some acceptable, some not. Uh, all these things, station two, the authority says, are actually to be read from station three. Kids, young children, when they're very uh, small, uh, they ask questions. And we must always remember that they ask the profoundest, profoundest questions. Uh, every child asks the questions of the great philosophers. They ask the questions of Plato, Spinoza, uh, Spinoza um, any, philo any philosopher you like, a child asks those questions, very, very basic questions. Why, what, wherefore, where from? Uh, questions as profound as that. So even the young child is asking these enormous questions. Uh, which actually adults really can't answer. But if you're going to meet people's needs, you've got to have some answer, you've got to have some explanation of what the world is about. Art, I think, is the images, the sounds, the dramas drawn on the wall of that boundary. Uh, and um, a very curious process happens because it's not a barbarous process, it is the civilizing process, and it's not a process of naked force. In other words, the people in the center do not say, shut up, they don't normally say it, they don't normally say, shut up, do what you're told. Uh, they say, we will tell you what the boundary says you are to do. And in a curious, curious way, in this authoritarian act, the basis of humanity gets laid. You cannot get people together in a group, willingly organized, unless you credit them with some dignity. 
some human dignity. And that dignity is granted by the boundary. In other words, in some way, your life, your mind is related to the boundary over there. If you don't have that, then you simply have to have a, a, a state that's totally barbarous and totally tyrannous. The nature of good and evil, the interpretation by that authority in the middle, changes extraordinarily and, and uh, good can uh, become evil and evil good overnight almost. Um, but basically the process of history is, since we still continue uh, through history to recognize ourselves as human beings and to credit ourselves with the dignity of being human beings, the, the, the process is basically civilizing. That tripart arrangement is to meet needs. That has been the discipline through history. And I would try to describe how that particular rela relationship has produced various forms of art. But I think that in our lifetime that situation has changed and it has changed radically for the first time and I think it makes a basic difference in what human societies are, uh, what it would mean to be a human being and uh, what human dignity is. Uh, I think the relationship alters. The relationship alters because we do not live in a community, a world of needs. That has changed. We live in a world of wants. Now that is a paradox, because if I say nobody has any needs anymore, then I have to say at the same time, yes, but more people are hungry, more people are cold, probably more people are in prison, and probably more people are starving now than has ever happened before. So it seems a paradoxical thing to say, which I am saying, is that people die of starvation not because they lack needs, not because somebody doesn't come along with a, 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 a bottle of water and some bread. They die because they lack luxuries. That's a very extraordinary thing. But it seems to me to be the truth of what we call the postmodern condition. It's a paradox. I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to try and explain it. Perhaps. Uh, what I mean by it will become clear as I go through my uh, little historical survey of the nature of drama, which is part of the nature of this relationship. Remember, ordinary people, the authority of the state or the church or the organization, and over there, the boundary, the answer to the basic questions, why, what? So I will now try and go through that survey. If we go back to very, very early times when life is not very technologically based, I mean, it's not swamped with machinery and so on, then you have a relationship which is true of religion and is true of art. The boundary becomes a place of darkness. It becomes a place uh, inhabited by spirits. It becomes a place inhabited by animal spirits. Um, it becomes a place uh, mysterious in, in that way. The central authority says we speak for that world out there. We can mediate in that, uh, between you and that world in some way. Probably in that situation, the authority in the middle is quite modest about what it does. Uh, but that's, that's a relationship, and you find early art, early um, drama, uh, early iconography, makes no strong distinction between human beings and animals. Um, uh, the totem animal of the tribe can be killed, eaten. The gods of the tribe, the gods of the pharaohs, can be closely related to the animal kingdom. I'm going to flip from that to another stage. I'm not going to go, obviously, through our history year by year. I'm just going to go to critical points. So I'm going to take those critical points mostly from the history of Western Europe. Not because that is in any way special. What I say will be, uh, will have analogies elsewhere, different patterns. 
but they will be common to all human societies which are organized in that basic way that I, I talked about. I'm going to jump from that world to the Greeks because the Greeks made, uh, for various reasons, they made a radical uh, alteration in, in the nature of that relationship. Curiously enough, what the Greeks did, they were also actually really rather modest because the central authority there was speculative. Uh, it discussed. Um, but it was aware that uh, it was surrounded again by a world which it didn't understand, didn't fully understand, uh, couldn't describe completely. And he said, uh, they said, well, that's the world of the gods. And the, girls, the gods were said to be arbitrary. But they did see the gods in the image of human beings, largely. Um, uh, that brought the gods closer, but in a, uh, that brought the boundary closer, but also at the same time it uh, removed it because if the boundary was a place of uh, godlike men almost and godlike women, you then had to say, and the Greek dramas said this, but they behave with appalling frivolity. Uh, they behave in an arbitrary way, and yet they seem to have the fate of ourselves and our, our societies and our communities in their hands. Uh, and yet they are so frivolous. And in a very strange way, I think the Greeks achieved their humanity by an act of defiance. That is, they submitted to their gods in their drama. They had nothing else that they could do. They submit. But in the act of submission, they curiously proved themselves stronger, more moral perhaps also more arrogant than their gods. And that's a very strange and a very clever arrangement. Um, you submit to fate, you defy it, and in that defiance you create your humanity. It's very, very clever. You lose your humanity, but at the same time you have this way of creating it for yourself. That society was a society able to speculate. It was a society also of slavery. So, although I've talked about achieving your humanity, it was perfectly possible in that society to say, yeah, but human beings are only a small select group, and outside that you have what are two-footed animals. That doesn't concede much humanity to many of those people who are born with the necessity of questioning their existence. The next stage I want to flip on to is Christianity because Christianity is also another very clever uh, resolution of this problem. Curiously enough, Christianity has no drama. It takes the play, it takes the drama from the stage and puts it in the real world. That, again, is very, very clever. It means that uh, instead of a dramatic problem being acted out in a play and tested and being uh, available to questioning, as it was in the Greek theatre, what it means is that the central authority now speaks absolutely for the boundary. So it's a very doctrinaire, a very authoritarian way. But its achievement, it says, it, its achievement is you are all human beings. Theoretically, you are all human beings. It so happens that some of you might actually lose the grace of God, and we will tell you when you do. So you see that there has been, a, there has been an advance, but also there has been a new process of institutional control. Christian art is very strange. It has more to do with images than words. God always talks. Everybody tells you what God says. I've never seen a picture painted by God. I've never heard a piece of music composed by God. Um, and that's a very subtle fact about art. It means that uh, the authority can choose very much what images 
are going to be useful. And instead of the heroes of the Greek pantheon, you get images of suffering, images of martyrdom, images of pain, in very subtle combinations. I mean, the basic, basic Christian picture is the one of the crucifixion, which shows the suffering subject and standing around it, the forces, the military forces of money and state authority. So even in icons as basic as that, somehow human dignity has to be conceded. Somehow in that arrangement, some acknowledgement of the right to have needs. That is, that if you have needs, you're not a brute, but you are a human being. Human beings have needs. The boundary, in this case, God says it is right that they should have needs. So that's a very workable arrangement, and it lasts for a long while. But societies are not static. Uh, technology changes. That uh, arrangement, the, the religious arrangement, is able to exist with a certain amount of slavery. You will come to a time, for various reasons, which I needn't go into now, you will come to a time when uh, the technological arrangements of society will change, and that means that you must have a different sort of human being. So far, we've had the theatre, if you like, of the animal. We've had the theatre of gods. We're going to have a new form of theatre in order to meet this new change relationship. What happens in the Reformation? Well, there are two things of great significance. One is there's a sudden interest in hell. Uh, and the other is that certain people in this subject group say to the group in the centre, you are not uh, able to tell us what the, uh, the boundary condition says, it speaks to us directly. That's the Protestant conscience. God speaks to me, I know what God says, I hear God, I can be an individual authority. The Puritans, curiously enough, broke images. They didn't make images, they smashed them. And one says to oneself, well, why didn't they start making new images? Whenever images have been broken in the past, somebody has always put an image in their place. Nobody put an image in their place. It was as if they could not picture their real image. Theatre, oddly enough, did. It's the spoken word. And somehow it, certainly on this occasion, I think, generally, somehow it seems to have a need to get closer to the mechanisms that are flittering around between those three stations. You've had the theatre of the animal, you've had the th uh, of, uh, of human beings and animals, the theatre of human beings and God. What is the theatre of the Renaissance? The theatre of the Reformation it is the theatre of human beings and the devil. Why the devil? Suddenly the theatre becomes intensely interested in the devil. The devil appears all over the place. Uh, if you look at uh, Marlowe, he's uh, a founding writer of that theatre. He writes Faust. It's the basic play. It's the play Shakespeare wanted to write, but couldn't. All Shakespeare's plays really could be titled, uh, subtitled Faust. Uh, he, yes, I think so. He, he, um, uh, he wants to write that play, and all the time he's, discover he's discovering what is devilish in people. Why? Why the sudden interest in the devil? Well, I've said this arrangement is not arbitrary. It occurs in order, ultimately, for authority to be able to say to that subject group over there, we can organize society in such a way that will entitle us to hold our power, but will concede certain elements of humanity to you. And what I have to tell you is that the production of the devil actually increased our humanity. Uh, because the devil is a symbol uh, symbol, he's a, a personification of energy. He's a symbol of the energy of the Industrial Revolution, to go a little further ahead. Um, the devil comes from factories. Um, there is new energy in the ground. Uh, there, are, there are machines which release energy in new ways. People have to live different lives. You have to release, you have, you have to re release in society some notification of this fact, and it's the devil. Uh, and that's why the Puritans don't make any images, because they would have to make an image of the devil, and that isn't on. 
I mean, no authority can actually say that. But if you want the pres presiding image of the Industrial Revolution, it's the devil. But it cannot be said. It appears, however, in drama. At the same time, you get an extraordinary outburst of demonology in society. Suddenly, there are witches everywhere because you have factories. And therefore, uh, you have to say, well, look, the mind is having to accommodate new forms of functioning, new areas aware of awareness, new s senses of self-presence. There's no way of accommodating with those old, uh, old uh, um, relationships. It's almost as if there's a disease in the head, so you pick out perhaps a vulnerable group where you can act out the drama of the devil possessing society. It's a terrible thing because it was immensely cruel. Uh, but very important to authority. Um, James I, first Stuart, Stuart King, James I, James IV, was absolutely possessed with the idea of demons. And I have a personal foible that he was against smoking because it was smoke coming out of people's mouths as a sign of pleasure and he regarded this as a symptom of hell. <laughs> could be, could be. Um, well, that's... That's a new form of society. Mm, naturally, the Puritans are going to shut the theatres down. Just as they broke, broke, broke images and didn't make one, they will shut the theatre down. Society, of course, goes on. Society is going to need um, uh, some new form of art that will accommodate uh, the, that new relationship. There's a new technology. The life of the street and the home must be different. Authority must find some way of talking about that and saying we speak for the boundary. Always human beings want somehow to legitimate their conscience, their humanity, by some sense of the total significance of life. What happens? They invent crime. Uh, crime is not the devil. Uh, crime has to do with property. Uh, crime has to do not with controlling the mind. You don't have heresy anymore. People aren't interested in heresy anymore. That's suddenly gone by the way. And they're, they're not interested in, in, in uh, heresy or, 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 or witches. They're interested in crime. And they virtually invent crime. And suddenly, the statute books are full of an enormous array of new crimes. And little children are hanged for stealing handkerchiefs and good law-abiding people stand around and watch <coughs> this spectacle and I, wh one has to say but this is extraordinary that's uh, a terrible debasement of what human beings are about and I have to say yeah but curiously enough it's part of that process by which we become more human it's the cost of being human again that's a paradoxical thing to say in our own time, I think crime has become deviance. That is that we've moved on from a stage of the devil to a stage of science, um, which is obviously liberating, but you can imagine that the central authority will also use that for repression. So crime becomes deviance, but you can't say the advance is permanent because the situation is unstable and anything could happen next. What happened around about the turn of the century was a sudden outburst of iconoclasm. That is, after the science of the 19th century, suddenly people like Picasso, like Dadaists, Dadaists and so on, started destroying images. They were doing exactly what the Puritans did. They smashed the image of what a human being was. They smashed the image of the relationship. But they put another image in its place. And that is really very, very curious because what they said is out of the debris, out of the ruins, in the debris, in the nature of ruins, if you like, in the nature of collapse, in the nature of degradation almost, if you like, we will find something which we will call form or some super real presence or something like that, which will somehow be an image of that barrier for us. But it's a very select and it's a very uh, ghettoized form of art, at least until it's used by admin. It's very enclosed. I think it's the first time, I think, in human history that.
people have said we can actually find form in chaos. Not like, oh, well, chaos would be good for a little while. Not like, oh, we will smash. But in the debris itself, you will find the answer. And that's, if you like, if you want to look at the theatre, that's the theatre of the absurd. <coughs> that everything falls apart and nothing has any meaning. One of the significant events of the Reformation was Luther throwing his ink pot at the devil. Uh, he was sitting at his desk, the devil appeared. He was all over the place at the time. And uh, <laughs> Luther threw his ink pot. I've always been worried about that. Why an ink pot? Seems a really absurd weapon to use against the devil. But it made a splash. It made a splash on the wall, it made a mark, and people used to be shown this mark. But Luther didn't say the mark has meaning. He didn't say, I look at that ruin on the wall, and I read something in it. He took his pen, he dipped it in the ink, and he virtually recreated the German language. That seems to me a way to use chaos. That seems to me a way to know how to be act, uh, to know how to act in the presence of the devil, it seems to me a way of knowing how to deal with the dangers and disasters that change in society always brings. Our situation now, and now I'm finishing that historical uh, survey and trying to look at that uh, three-part relationship in our present society, our situation now I find totally, totally extraordinary because what has happened is that for the first time somebody has said, or philosophers of the first time, for the first time have said, no it started to happen actually two or three hundred years ago but somebody said, well actually we can de deconstruct everything because the barrier has no meaning. There is no meaning there. There is no intellectual, no moral meaning. Words only relate to each other, they don't refer to real things, they don't refer to human qualities. Uh, you can de deconstruct all work. To find the evasions, the lies in those works, well, yes, of course, of course. If a man has no legs, I suppose, he has artificial legs and he has a stick. But you don't then say he doesn't want to walk. You say at that time he didn't have the right equipment. And of course you can look through history and you can find all those evasions, all those lies, all those distortions that I've talked about, but it seems to me a humanizing process. It does not seem to be a tale told by an idiot full of sound of fury with no meaning. It seems to be essentially human, and if we lose that, then I don't know what we've got. Because you see, if you live in a society of wants, then you don't have the discipline of need. That relationship I've talked about was always immensely disciplined. There was a technology, there was a state, there were subjective people who, who, who had needs, and over there, there was a world beyond our imagining, beyond our, uh, well, beyond our understanding, which somehow we needed to interpret. We had to say we were human beings in the right place for human beings to be in. And all our ethical and moral sense comes out of that relationship, all our drive to create art, to create images for ourselves, which are usable, which uh, become structured in our mind. All that process is a humanizing process and should not be chucked on one side. But if there, are, if there is no discipline in our society at the moment in the sense that wants create a discipline, what I have to say, uh, I'm sorry, that needs create a discipline, what I have to say is that Wants cannot be reduced to needs. And then I'm really not quite certain where you are. I mean, you could say, well, that's a very extraordinary thing because everybody's going around buying things and getting themselves into debt. And I have to say they have no needs. Well, culturally, they have no needs. They have no needs that are a foundation of culture. They have wants which are artificially created, artificially manipulable. If you had the god or the devil in the past, he was good for two or three hundred years every time he appeared. I mean, if we had a god now, we'd have to change his fashion every week. We'd have to have a new god every week. And I have to say something else about technology, because 
Um, I don't want you to think I'm a Luddite. Uh, I think that technology is an enormous benefit to human beings. Mm -hmm. So is a car, if it's properly driven. If it's not, it becomes very dangerous. You can't have a technology which does not find human images in art. You won't be able to relate that sequence, that tripart sequence, in a way which will enable people to enhance their humanity, their dignity, their consciousness of the dignity of other people. What is the characteristic of technology? Well, I have to tell you, and this is perhaps the greatest paradox of all, that we are in heaven. We are in heaven. Uh, let's, uh, let's not, um, let's not uh, have this uh, sense of a utopia out there, yeah, which we've always had in the past. Our society is heaven. You have arrived at heaven. You can't pretend there's a utopia out there that you can somehow go to in that tripart relationship. Your problem is that you live in heaven, because you have wants. You don't have any needs anymore. You live in heaven. Uh, and our society is heavenly. Well, I mean, heaven isn't what, we, uh, what it was cracked up to be. Well, we might have known that. I mean, we might have known that. But nevertheless, from the cultural point of view, we live in heaven. I mean, you, what, what do you say? Well, uh, all right, well, I will pay my mortgage off or something. Or, uh, well, if you pay your mortgage off, then you must have a new annex, you see. So that, all right, so there is no final state out there which is different from the present which is utopian in that way. There is no vision that you can say, all right, that authority will tell you about that vision. It doesn't exist in that relationship. If it's going to exist, it will have to come from somewhere else. I think that the main characteristic of technology is terror, actually. I think technology creates terror. I know it provides lots of very valuable, lots of important things, but it also, because our relationship is, the tripart relationship is not a sound and viable one at the moment, technology functions as a form of terror. That is, that we find suddenly there are new diseases, suddenly, like gods, we can change the atmosphere, suddenly old injustices inherited from a society of needs become much more dangerous in a society of technology uh, and, and wants. Everything becomes more dangerous. The 19th century had a feeling of awe and a feeling of angst. They weren't quite certain what the future was going to be. They didn't know about world wars. But we live in a society where we know what the terrors are. We can put faces or images on them. Um, we can say, well, like it's an evil empire or something like that, or we can have uh, some deviant group that we can pillory in various ways. We can always form images in that way. But basically, I think, what you have is terror, fear. So there you are, you are living in heaven, and you're, and you're surrounded by terror. That is a paradox, but I think it would be a, a, an accurate description of our society. What do people do in that situation? In that situation, what you've really got to do is find some way of explaining evil. Now, I think we're in a religious revival at the moment, not because people need God, but because they need the devil. We need the devil again. Like we have to have some image that will tell us, uh, well, there is, um, uh, uh, there is a certain terror. Somehow, this has got to be explained. Institutionally, it's got to be explained. We've got to have some image. We've got to have an art that will deal with terror. Why is it? Why is it? Tell me why it is that Americans want to make films saying that little kids are possessed of the devil. Why? I mean, for Christ's sake, you know. I mean, look, 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 after a million years of history, we have, to have, we have to use cameras to say that little kids are possessed of the devil. And what's the Royal Shakespeare Company want to do? Well, he wants to put on a play, a musical play, musical so it's nice, you see, a musical play about a little girl possessed of the devil. Well, we have to say greatly to the honour of the theatre that it failed. It had a flop. 
What's it going to do now? It's going to do the Clockwork Orange as a musical, because there are a lot of louts, thugs, layabouts, criminals, viciously possessed people out there, and we must have a musical about them. <laughs> I tell you quite, quite seriously, I tell you quite, quite seriously that that is an appallingly barbarous use of art. That is a, an appallingly barbarous arrangement of that tripart relationship. And I don't think that a society which has our enormously advanced technology can actually live with the devil. Look, if a medieval pope had an H bomb, he would have dropped it on, the, on the, the Saracens or something. It would have been his duty. He'd have gone to heaven. It would have been fine. The boundary was real. We cannot have a society which knows so little about itself that it needs the devil and yet at the same time has this extraordinary amount of technology. These things must not be discussed. These things must not be put on the stage. These things must not be imaged. These things must not be talked about. The ad man cometh. If you say these things, then people actually stop wanting People would get frightened. People would hide. What would people do? I don't know. I don't know what uh, the future of that society would be like, but I know it would not be good. I know it would not increase human dignity. That would be a very bad society. But it seems to me that we're not offering the postmodern world anything other than that. A young dramatist who I admired a few years ago, a socialist writer, I admired him, didn't wholly like his work, but it showed promise, has suddenly discovered he believes in evil. Yes, he believes in evil. It's some sort of liquid or something sort of flopping around out there, searching around for suitable receptacles. Another young writer, who I also admired rather more than the other one, I'm not naming names, um, has suddenly discovered, would you believe it, that Beckett is right after all and communication is impossible. And he spends a lot of time elaborately putting on plays, elaborately rehearsing the message so that it's communicated properly, that communication is, is impossible. I don't understand that. I really don't understand that. I don't know why people want to waste their lives or waste the lives of their audiences in that way. So there you are. I've produced a rather absurd society. I've stated it in terms of paradox, but I believe that the paradox to be true. You are in heaven and you need the devil. Not you personally, but your society. And that's not a good situation. And if they want to take away your money, if I want to put a play, say I wanted to put a play on at the RSC or something like that, I don't think I would be so silly, but supposing I won't want to do that, then in actual fact that play would be looked at, they will say it wouldn't be, but it would be looked at by a group of businessmen. And they will say whether or not they want that play to go on. So there are, you see, there is the, inter there is, there is the, the institutional intervention, absolutely quite crudely. Well, I seem to have stated a lot of problems. The one I haven't dealt with the organization of opposition to the situation, which is important. I'm not going to deal with that because it would carry me beyond my immediate, the immediate brief I've given myself. But I have said that young kids ask questions, and that is extraordinary. Uh, those questions can be, I, I call it radical innocence. I mean, I'm not, not, I don't believe in the cult of the kid, and I, I'm not naive about children. But just the fact that those basic questions are asked and have to be answered, and so that there is no permanent answer, and that they are always subject to question, they're always subject to test and examination. That I find an immensely hopeful sign. You will be closer to that than I normally am. That's why they want to stop you, and they do want to stop you. <coughs> Don't have any doubt about that. It is necessary that you are stopped. Barbarism seeps up, or it comes dropping from the sky, it comes flooding, it comes in many ways. It will find the way that it can be least noticed until it wants to be noticed. 
I don't have those answers. I work at the answers in what I write. You have to work at those answers in your work. I've made some jokes, but only because the subject is so painful to me. Mm, the murder of people begins culturally. I say that absolutely seriously. Like, you know, you can murder somebody culturally and in a few, in a few years' time they'll go off and shoot somebody else, they'll be going to press a button, they won't know what they're doing. You must murder someone. Well, I think you can't look in a human face and not see the face of somebody who hasn't been murdered, but also not see the face of somebody who is not also a murderer. That's part of the richness of drama. It's part of our imaginary creative life. There is a reality about imagination. I want just to flip back to the Greeks. The Greeks put God on their stage. God came on the stage, even when Euripides was rather cynical about these things. Well, not cynical, but very questioning. The gods came on. They were imaginary, but they were real on stage. Now, the gods didn't meet the, the, the Greeks didn't meet God in the street. I mean, if gods appeared in the Greek streets, then it was in the form of frenzy, in the form of possession, and they rather escaped from that. On the, on the stage, they used gods. That is, that on the stage they were real, because they solved the problem. In cultural terms, in terms of that theatre, the gods were real, as real as a machine. In fact, they used the gods rather on the stage, rather as we use machines. Well. That means that imagination has its own reality, that it is an extraordinarily potent force. Of course, it can be frivolous, it can be fanciful, it can be decadent, it can be arbitrary, but there is a, there is a structured, disciplined use of imagination which is immensely powerful. The human mind reflects itself in those creative images in order to create its humanity. That is a process which is only achieved through cost of various sorts. But I'm certain it's a very important process. There's nothing natural about human beings. We are, and here I could, I, as I told you, I think this is built into the structure of the human mind. There's nothing natural about us. We are cultural products and we take our humanity from our culture, either by, through assent, either by questioning, either by accepting a universal order, or by creating an opposition. They're complex questions. I can't go into those now. But the one thing I'm certain about is that if I have stated a time of problems, and I think I have, it is a time not of pessimism. Uh, I've never felt more useful as a creative artist than I feel now. It doesn't mean to say I have an audience, but I've never felt the ability to speak, the need to speak rather than the ability, greater now. And I've never felt the, the presence of listeners greater than in the last few years. I don't have the answers to those problems, but I'm absolutely certain that you are part and a very important part of the answer. Thank you. Please to take any questions or anything that you want to say. British Columbia, Canada. If I have to buy into your philosophy that there is no final state out there, that we've already arrived at heaven, can I subscribe to the implication that for the third world, then, 
Heaven is just out there, or do they want it? And as an educator who's trying to uh, raise the level of awareness in Western world, in the Western world, uh, to, what, to the injustices that's happening in the third world, what can I do? Well, if we say this sort of thing, I'll just say no. Nah. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm very conscious of the paradox of what I say, uh, because um, it is a cruel paradox. Uh, I'm trying to look at it from uh, the point of view of uh, a particular culture in which I have to work. What I'm saying, what I would say is like, I'm not interested in acts of charity by that, by that culture. I'm not very interested in things like Band-Aid. All right, so I mean, it might be valuable, I don't want to knock anybody. But you know, like, if one thinks, well, that solves the problem in some way, then I say, well, no, the problem has to be absolutely more radical. Uh, what, it, what, it has to, what it means is uh, there has to be some way in which people who are being exploited by uh, the world of wants, if you like, uh, people who are being exploited in that way must find their voice. They must uh, make demands uh, so that they are not exploited, uh, so that they um, achieve uh, a dignified human life. That's a political question and a cultural question. Um, but I think I would ra rather imagine that uh, what you have to do is work for understanding um, of those problems in the societies that you're talking about. I said that you have the answer. <laughs> You see, I, I, there are, there are no, you know, what one wants is some sort of magic wand, you know, that would, that would, that would solve that problem. There isn't. It's a fight. It's a fight. And it's a fight which demands people's lives. I know it's very easy for me to sit here and say those things, um, uh, but I don't know any other answer. But we can say that there is a cultural function. We can say that it is possible for us to uh, produce solidarity among people, to enable p communities to become conscious of themselves and conscious of their exploited state. I always think that in the end, people have to solve their own problems, you know? That nobody else can solve your problems for you. You have to become conscious of your, 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 your problem, and you then have to demand that it, is, that it is seen to, or that you see to it yourself. Is that a useful answer? It's provocative. That's useful. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. You'd let me off very lightly. I'm very pleased. Yes, of course. Yes, yes I and mean, please don't confine yourself to questions if you want to talk or oppose or probe. Go ahead. Uh, Tam McIntyre at Cockpit Theatre and Education Team. It's, uh, it's really to ask for some expansion because I think the most uh, provocative and important uh, thing that has been said to this conference is that it is necessary that we are stopped. 
right? Necessary that we are stopped. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, uh, it would be nice, it's not a want that we are stopped, it's a need <coughs> that we are stopped. Yes. And um, that seems to me to relate to the uh, aspect of young people, the young people that we work with, as the new generation of, uh, of askers of profound questions. Mm -hmm. Not because they want to ask profound questions, but because they need to. Mm -hmm. That is part of their being young people, mm -hmm. that they have to struggle to understand themselves in the world and understand the world they are in. Therefore, they cannot but ask those profound questions again generationally again. Um, so those two things relate in terms of us needing to be stopped and the fact that we have a position in relation to those young people as the new generation of askers of profound questions. Those two things seem to me to be related. Um, and I don't ha I, I, in a way I don't have anything more to say about it at the moment, but I, but I just wanted to acknowledge the uh, the the shock not the shock in the sense of uh, that I don't know that but the shock of recognition in hearing it in a new way and to sort of locate it for us as we go further into the conference in relation to what what do we do where are, where are we going and what and what are we going to do for and with those young people and for and with them for their and our future. Because that seems to me to be where the, the heart of the problem that we are addressing in this conference actually lies for us. Thank you. Any more questions or contributions from the floor? It is, if I to just comment on that, because I, I, that makes total sense to me. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say you've got to be stopped. I mean, I do think that is the situation. But it's, uh, there are people, I'm not a sort of, cons I don't have conspiracy theories about society, I have conspiracy facts. There are... <laughs> Sorry. There are, there are people sitting around tables uh, who, who, who will say things like that. Uh, drama in education, apart from being naff and stupid and a waste of time, money, energy and all the rest of it, is also a cause of social deviance. It disrupts people. It makes people unhappy. Um, and, uh, this, uh, and then all the institutions uh, somehow, because I know people ha want success in their, in their careers, this will sap this up. Can I tell you a little anecdote? Can I, um, I think one ought to try and retain one's ability to be shocked. But even if I had lost my ability, I would have been shocked by this. Um, I, I was recently working in, the, in a, a television studio, and I did it because the man who was going to film this thing that I'd written said, it's all right, Edward, you can trust me because I'm... <laughs> yeah, anybody says that. Uh, you can trust me because I am going to do exactly what you want. That's all I want to do. I thought, well, an extraordinary man. <laughs> um, and uh, I really can't miss this opportunity, can I? So I went ahead and did it. Well, he did nothing I wanted. But, I, but nothing, nothing. Not like occasionally he disagreed. He disagreed on principle uh, that he would do nothing. And one day in total ex exasperation, I said to him, but you said to me that you would do everything I wanted. And he smiled seraphically and said, ah, but when I said that, I didn't mean it. <laughs> now that's extraordinary. Not like, ah, oh, yeah, but like it's give and take or something. No, he didn't mean it. He was an institution where you said things like that and they had no meaning. And that, was, that had become normality. That's television. That is a sort of uh, 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 a, a place where uh, culture is uh, spread around the community, where a culture is used to vivify situations, to 
activate situations, to involve people in situations, but not to question them. I mean, I found with the work that I was doing there that everything was actually being pushed back to the 19th century. I mean that quite literally. No, I don't mean it literally, obviously. Uh, but I mean it seriously. Um, uh, that everything was being interpreted uh, on evaluations, on descriptions of behavior, on knowledge, and so on, that really nobody has accepted for about a hundred years. And curiously, the theater somehow when it says, well, we want to get down to the basic things, makes uh, appalling mistakes of that sort. This is a pattern of the human mind. Everybody thinks, well, look, there's, 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 a, there's a, a brain up there which is cerebral and which is rational, which is thinkable, and underneath you get these other brains which are more primitive and uh, uh, are more emotional and more dangerous. And therefore, it must follow, must it not, that the lower brain must in some way be victimizing, dictating, subverting the higher brain. But why? Why couldn't you say, no, it's the higher brain that actually t is the foundation? I mean, there's no philosophical, there's no scientific reason why you shouldn't argue that way. And then what you would say is, well, actually, actually, yeah, of course, like we do have instincts, but we could start talking about we learn our instincts. Yes, I mean, kids learn, uh, uh, kids eat automatically, or they take milk in automatically, but very, very soon, uh, taking food becomes a cultural activity, becomes a family battleground, becomes a way of defining identity. And it's then that it's more important, then that it's more basic. Why? Because it is, it, the, the child has thought its instincts. Do you see the point I'm making? So the idea that, you know, that there is some sort of primitive uh, human being somehow struggling with a, a, a level uh, of enculturation, that sort of Freudian model, I, f I think to be absolutely unsound. I don't see there's, there's any evidence for it. But you try telling an actor to understand that, an act, and you usually create problems. You know, I mean, unless the actor is on your wavelength. But I don't see how we can act our times unless we do that. What we need, you see, I mean, if you look at somebody like uh, Stanislavski, what you've got is you've got a play which has a text and a subtext. And you find the subtext and that somehow activates the play. We need a metatext. We need the text on top which will create situations in the drama, which will then produce various forms of human beings, and we can say, right, well, that's fine. Um, we can see how that human being produced him or herself in that situation. That, I believe, to be actually what happens in society. Society is uh, functioning on a more advanced level than uh, what we normally uh, manage to do in our theatre and our drama. We should have no illusions about what theatre and what drama can do. If I write a play and it's put on, I don't put that play on in order to make the audience good or better or wiser. I want to make some of the audience worse. Because look, if I'm going to tell the truth, and I live in a society which is unjust, and that's our basic problem, if you have an unjust society, then you cannot do that tripart arrangement in such a way that you increase the, uh, the human quality of, uh, of minds by consent of the institution. You only do it in, uh, in acts of defiance. But if I write a play, well, I, then I, I'm, not, I'm not doing it from an institutional point of view that I have some divine muse which will tell me total truth that will suddenly convert everybody into being good people. If I put on a good play, I want to make some of the audience more fascist. What else can I do? Some of the audience will go out more fascist, fine, but I will have made them more fascist. That's the important point. I will have defined for them more clearly what fascism is. Of course, I mean, I hope some of the audience will go out uh, able to fight fascism better because of my play. But quite clearly, if I'm going to do that, then I'm also going to do the other. We should have no illusions. Art is dangerous in that way. But we can't shut up, because if we do that, then forms of fascism and reaction will take over completely. To find a theatre can, that can do that and can do that in an exciting way is really what our, our society is crying out for. And I suppose that's another reason why we have to be stopped. And that's the end of this session. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh...